Hi, everybody. If we get, uh, get organized here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the University of Wisconsin Law School's uh, 2009 Robert W. Kastenmeyer Lecture. Uh, I'm Ken Davis, Dean of the Law School, and it's uh, always great to see our extended law school community come together for this annual program on a topic of timely significance to the legal profession. Uh, this year, we are proud to present three of, our, of our, our law school's own accomplished faculty who will share with us uh, some of their thinking outside the box on approaches to the field of criminal justice. Um, as a beginning, it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, uh, it's, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a very good job of reading right here. Uh, um, it's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speakers, beginning with our uh, distinguished UW Law School graduate, Robert W. Kastenmeyer for whom this lecture series is named. Congressman Kastenmeyer served our state and nation in an outstanding manner for 32 years in the United States House of Representatives, making important contributions in diverse fields ranging from intellectual property to the administration of justice. In the years since he left Capitol Hill, he's continued to bring intelligence, wisdom, and experience uh, to his work on a, a range of critical issues. We always look forward to welcoming Bob Kastenmeyer back to his alma mater and to hearing his views on matters with which he has been directly involved. Congressman Kastenmeyer. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Davis. And I too would like to welcome you to this lecture. I think it's the 16th in a series that uh, dates back to 1992. And so uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to be back for this, this event. At the outset, I would also like to particularly thank uh, Professor, uh, well, before I get into that, I, I want to thank those responsible for the program, uh, which uh, certainly means uh, uh, those who'd worked on it uh, administratively, uh, Kimberly Frank, and, uh, and certainly um, Theresa Evans. But primarily, I want to thank uh, Peter Carsonson, who really gave the leadership to present this particular program at this time as a, as a timely program, as uh, Dean Davis has suggested. Uh, I would like to um, say that originally uh, it was our intention to bring uh, matters uh, here, uh, policies and questions of, of federal and public law uh, that were primarily originated in the Judiciary Committee uh, and in the Congress. To a large extent, uh, the lectures in the past have represented that. Uh, however, this, uh, this particular one is exactly on point. The Judiciary Committee, among others, had as its subcommittees, uh, a subcommittee on crime, a subcommittee on criminal justice, and my subcommittee, which was a subcommittee on, on prisons. And Believe me, we visit more prisons, I think, than any other committee of the Congress in the history of the Congress. And so uh, there is this connection with the, with the past and with the, and with the work of uh, the federal government and the House of Representatives on the questions that our distinguished panel is going to address. Particularly, of course, we know that the, the position of the states with respect to budget, the overcrowding of institutions, and, very, and to the extent that we rely, frankly, on federal judges to challenge uh, institutions in terms of constitutional standards, these are all still very much uh, an issue confronting this nation. And so it was a great pleasure for me to, to see that the presentation involving Professor Dickey, Professor uh, Kingbelli, 
and Professor Scott is devoted to this. I'm sure it will be worthwhile and I look forward to the program. Uh, thank you very much, Congressman. Um, all three of, um, of the UW Law professors who are about to speak with us on the topic of reimagining criminal justice are attorneys, scholars, and teachers who spent a great deal of time uh, do doing just what the title says, reimagining criminal justice. I've got prepared introductions, but for uh, reasons that you'll appreciate in a second, I'm going to uh, alter the order a bit. <coughs> um, beginning with uh, our newest addition, and at least at the faculty level, visiting assistant professor Celia Klingo. Uh, Celia is a 2005 graduate of the law school, is back among us after a series of three judicial clerkships, the first one with uh, Chief, Justice, uh, or Chief Judge Barbara Crabb of, of the U.S. District, uh, of the Western District of Wisconsin, who is, uh, we have the good uh, fortune of having with us tonight, uh, and the last one with U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. Professor Klingo previously served as a supervising attorney in the Remington Center, and this semester she's teaching Introduction to Substantive Criminal Law. She focuses her academic research on criminal justice administration and serves as co-chair of the ABA Criminal Justice Section and its Committee on Corrections. Um, also with us uh, this evening is clinical associate professor Michael Scott, um, who joined the faculty in 2003 as director of the Center for Problem-Oriented Policing and is a graduate of the Harvard Law School uh, who first became interested in the study of policing as an undergraduate here at UW-Madison when he took courses about policing uh, from law school professor Herman Goldstein, another one of our faculty known for innovative uh, thinking on how the law is practiced in reality as opposed to how it appears on the books. Uh, both before and after his Harvard work, Professor Scott served as a police officer himself, starting with the Madison Police Department and going on to high-level police administration in New York City and other departments across the country. His prolific research provides problem-specific assistance to police professionals all over the world, and his outreach includes advisory work with the Madison Police, uh, with the Madison Police and officer training uh, sessions throughout Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> finally, we have, um, excuse me here for a second, Professor Walter Dickey, a 1971 graduate of the law school, um, who's been a faculty director of the Remington Center since he joined the faculty in 1976. Professor Dickey led the state of Wisconsin Division of Corrections from 1983 to 1987 and drafted its administrative rules. Uh, he was the federal monitor for the Supermax prison at Boscobel, Wisconsin, and chaired the Wisconsin Judicial Council when he modernized the law of homicide. He's the author of numerous publications on criminal justice and professional responsibility and chaired the Governor's Task Force on Sentencing and Corrections. And that's my, uh, that's my prepared remarks, but I just wanted to add something else because this semester wa uh, uh, marks uh, Walter's completion of four and a half years as uh, as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs to the law school. 50% longer, by the way, than what I could coax him into, uh, and uh, um, fortunately for us, stayed on. But I want to sort of talk about it from a different perspective, because Walter and I sort of grew up together on this faculty, um, and he followed a legend, which is not always difficult, uh, but nonetheless has been tremendous in terms of supporting the Remington legacy, and also, um, Throughout all my dealings with Walter, it is always about the institution rather than him personally. And so some of his accomplishments um, maybe don't get the credit that they deserve. But I can tell you from being dean at this place for 12 years and a faculty member for 31 that uh, I believe nobody rivals Walter in terms of a role in promoting the quality of our criminal justice program generally, and the strength and professionalism of our clinics in particular. Um, we all owe him a debt of thanks on that. And this is a, a, I'm sorry if I'm embarrassing you, Walter, but this is a, I thought this is, might be my last chance to do it with a public audience as opposed to our own faculty. So please join me in welcoming uh, Walter Dickey, Michael Scott, and Cecilia Klingo. Thank you.
thank you, Tim, for that very nice introduction. Uh, and thank you, Ka uh, Congressman Kastenmeier, for uh, all your work in the Congress and for your uh, participation and involvement in these lectures. I've attended most of them, and they have all been terrific, and I hope we can live up to the legacy that's been set here. I also want to thank, on behalf of the other speakers, um, the committee uh, who put this all together, and also the law school for, of course, hosting it. Uh, but it's really time to get on to business because we've got a lot of business to cover. Um, I'd just say briefly, we'd like to first uh, explore why we think the system needs to be reimagined. Uh, after that, we're going to talk some about why we think the system is based on some fundamentally flawed assumptions. And then explore what we think are promising principles and assumptions about the future. And also promising directions that we think the system is, is going. Uh, we'd conclude with some consideration of the implications of our thinking uh, for police, prosecutors, correctional agents, and judges. Uh, and finally, the implications for research in this important field and for legal education, which we think obviously plays a vital role in the improvement of the criminal justice system. Well, we started out with a fairly bold assertion, and that is that the system needs reimagining. Uh, and I think we can fairly be asked to explain why we believe that. What's the predicate? What's the facts or factual basis for that assertion? I think we would say that really on the uh, measures that matter, uh, effectiveness, fairness, efficiency, uh, the system really doesn't live up to what we can fairly expect of it. Uh, Mike Scott's going to lead off and talk some about uh, a more detailed explanation of that bold assertion. Well, this certainly won't be any surprise to those of you who work in the criminal justice system today, but in many of the jurisdictions around the country, the criminal justice system is overwhelmed, overloaded just by the volume of business coming into it. Prosecutors, judges struggling just to keep up with the volume of cases that are brought into the system mainly by the police. But it's also worth stepping back and, and re reflecting on the fact that whatever amount of work enters the criminal justice system, it pales in comparison to the total volume of issues and incidents that are out there in the community threatening public safety. For example, uh, the police are tasked with detecting certain crimes, being out there looking for them, and yet we know that with, with respect to certain types of crimes, the police don't detect very many of them. We know, for example, that with respect to one of the most common crimes, retail drug dealing, only somewhere around one out of every 200 to 500 drug deals are detected by a police officer. With another common crime problem, drunk driving, <clears throat> we estimate that perhaps only one out of every 1,000 drunk driving trips are detected by the police. And even for those crimes in which a victim uh, could report the crime to the police, we know that about half of all the crimes that occur never get reported to the police. Some of them that do get reported to the police for various reasons, some proper, some improper, the police do not officially acknowledge them as being criminal matters and therefore don't investigate them as fully as they might. Even for those offenses for which the police acknowledge that a crime has occurred and have probable cause to believe that the person in front of them has committed it, in many instances the police exercise their professional discretion and do not invoke the criminal law, do not arrest the person, even when they have legal grounds to do so. Sometimes that's motivated by simple capacity limits. A few years back, I was in San Diego, California, and the police at that time were told by the county jail, <clears throat> at least for a period of several months, the jail is full. Do not, under any circumstances, bring it to us anybody under arrest for a misdemeanor. Whatever else you may do with them, do not bring them here. We simply don't have space. Other times, police officers exercise their discretion in not choosing to arrest out of professional judgment 
that there is a better, more sensible way, an alternative to arrest, to handle that particular matter. So a good deal of, of work that could plausibly end up in the criminal justice system via police discretion does not. Even those cases in which the police uh, acknowledge that a crime has occurred uh, and engage in a criminal investigation, the clearance rates or the, the ability of the police to solve crimes is much less than many people imagine. For example, even with a serious crime like aggravated assault where a victim perhaps got a good look at the offender, only about one out of every two of those cases gets solved. With respect to robbery, only about one out of every four cases gets solved by the police. And with crimes like auto theft, burglary, and larceny, fewer than one out of five on average get solved by the police. Where police do make arrests and refer a case over to the prosecutor's office, we know that there are, in many jurisdictions, fairly high rates of non-prosecution of the cases by the district attorneys. Sometimes on evidentiary grounds, it's insufficient evidence, or there are problems with constitutional provisions. Sometimes on policy grounds, if the district attorney emphasizes certain cases over others, <clears throat> and all too often and increasingly on workload grounds, the district attorney's office simply cannot keep up with the workload. Recently, the district attorney in Contra Costa County, California, sent a note to all the police agencies in the county listing the, the types of crimes to include burglary and theft that would no longer be prosecuted by that office. They simply didn't have the resources to do it. Some years back, district attorney in Lane County, Oregon, went so far as to put a little coupon in the newspaper asking readers of the newspaper to vote for their favorite crimes that they wanted prosecuted. <laughs> because the district attorney, in a, in a uh, out of, out of necessity and out of uh, honesty he was saying, I simply don't have the resources to prosecute them all. I want you, the electorate, to tell me which ones you want me to, to choose. And of course, as uh, uh, the DAs here in Dane County will acknowledge and recognize, uh, this problem is no uh, stranger to us even here in Dane County where the resources are, are tremendously strained. Where cases uh, are prosecuted, we know and we've known for a long time that over 90% of those cases get resolved by some sort of a plea agreement. Now, of course, that acknowledges that a conviction uh, results from that, but typically it results in some form of lesser punishment than what might otherwise be expected. And moreover, at a minimum, it means that there is no full hearing, no full judicial hearing of the particular crime problem at the bar. Many, many cases suffer from very long delays in case processing, a year, 18 months, or longer. Uh, and as we know from, uh, from criminological theory, delay is the enemy of deterrence. The longer the case takes, uh, the less likely it is it will have the deterrent effect that we seek. Where we do get convictions, where we do get judges handing down sentences, we know that we have a fairly high rate of non-compliance with court orders. Failure of defendants to appear in court, failure to pay the fines that are set, failure to report to jail, failure to abide by the conditions of bail and probation, oftentimes leading to arrest warrants being issued, but in many police agencies, the volume of those arrest warrants that go unserved is rather staggering. And even where we get offenders convicted and sentenced to community supervision, we often know that the, the extent of that community supervision by overworked probation officers is sometimes cursory at best. The main point to be made here is that the volume of offending that's occurring within the community so far exceeds the capacity of the criminal justice system to process it all that even significant increases in capacity more prosecutors, more judges, more police, will have probably only a marginal effect on the certainty and the swiftness with which punishment is administered. So as important as the criminal justice system is, its capacity limitations alone mean that we could never hope to address all offending through the full and complete use of the criminal law process. 
I think there's reason to be concerned about the fairness of the system as well. Uh, there's lots of different ways we could think about and define fairness. Uh, but even in a fairly narrow iteration, uh, that is to say the conviction of the guilty, uh, the innocent going free, Recent developments in the innocence movement around this country, and here at the law school, our Innocence Project has uh, participated in that, have really raised serious questions. I think far beyond any that most of us who'd worked in the system would have imagined about the number of people uh, who've been convicted of offenses for which they're not guilty. Uh, one of the things that I've frequently said, and I, I wish, uh, I'd heard it said more, uh, that's also of concern to me that's revealed by the innocent's work, is that very often it, the uh, wrongful convictions uh, are the result of faulty work by the police and by others. And the worry one has to have is whether that faulty work is also at work in cases in which no one is convicted. That is to say, the guilty go free because of the faulty work that perhaps is most starkly illustrated by the, by the uh, innocent cases. So one has to be concerned about the fairness of the system, and I think if one expanded one's definition of fairness, I think one's concerns would deepen. One of the other things that I think has been revealed by a lot of this work is that some of the sort of foundational evidentiary uh, uses that we've had in the past several decades have now look not really as strong as we once thought they were. Some of the science, quite frankly, is just junk science, and I think it's been, uh, it's really been dismissed, but either other science that I think we've taken more seriously, and frankly should take more seriously, has also been revealed to have flaws, changes in thinking, changes in discovery have led us to realize that perhaps some of the evidence gathering techniques and some of the weight that we have accorded that kind of evidence really is not weight that it should, that it deserves. Um, all of this, I think, revealed by these new developments calls into question, as I said, the fairness of the system, even when it's defined in the most narrow sorts of ways. Equally worrisome with respect to the fairness of the system as it is currently carried out is the disparate racial impact of current enforcement policy. 38% of the country's 2 million prison inmates are African American, despite the fact that only 13% of the general population is African American. Based on current rates of first incarceration, approximately one out of every three black men will be incarcerated in state or federal prison during the, his lifetime. That's compared to one out of every 15 white men. Sadly, racial disparity is even more extreme in our own state where African Americans comprise almost half of our prison population, despite the fact that they comprise only 6% of our general population. That statistic is so concerning that it led the governor to establish a special statewide commission, which includes several graduates of this law school. That commission's findings and recommendations were issued last year, and they suggest that fundamental and systemic changes are required to address the problem of racial disparity throughout Wisconsin. It's important to remember that racial disparity does not just occur within the prison system, but at every stage of the criminal justice process, from first police contact and arrest, through parole release and revocation. And while the causes and cures for racial bias in the criminal justice system are multiple and complex, they demand greater attention from us and suggest that the importance, the importance of fundamentally re-examining the way in which our current criminal justice system currently operates. Now, some of these, uh, the concerns about a fairness are intolerable under any circumstances and, and must be addressed. The concerns about the, the workload, the volume, the efficiency of the system might be somewhat tolerable if the end result, in spite of all of that inefficiency, uh, was net effective uh, criminal justice. By effective, we meant that in spite of all of that, it yielded a certain degree of significant deterrence for future criminal offending and greater public safety. But we have reason to think that, that the conventional instruments for delivering public safety and justice, deterrence, incapacitation, rehabilitation, are ultimately limited and often applied somewhat indiscriminately and not with as much purpose as we think they could be. 
even where deterrence might be realized through the threat of punishment, that punishment and the threat of punishment is often administered so poorly that the deterrent effect is weakened. For example, for deterrence to, to take effect, offenders and potential offenders must appreciate the risks of, of punishment and the nature of that punishment. And we sometimes assume that they know what all those risks and consequences are. But we often fail to make sure that they, in fact, do understand those risks and consequences. And if they do not, in fact, understand what their risks of being apprehended, their risks of being punished, and the nature of the punishment they face, deterrence can't have its effect. To many offenders, and most troublesome, to many high-rate offenders, their perception of the prospects of punishment is that it is low probability, relatively unpredictable, relatively weak, and in some instances, fundamentally unfair. All of which basically undermines the prospects for deterrence to take effect. And we want to be careful this is, in, in, in asserting this is not to say that the criminal justice system does not deter any offending. In fact, we know it deters quite a lot. We only need to imagine a world in which we had no criminal justice system and what that world would look like. Undoubtedly, there would be a lot more offending than there is. But when up to one half and sometimes three quarters of the incarcerated offenders get rearrested for another criminal offense within three years of being released from incarceration, we are forced to conclude that there is some room to improve and some need to think about a broader approach to crime control than simply through punishment alone. We think the whole idea of what public safety is needs to be reconsidered. Uh, so far, we've been talking in fairly conventional terms about arrest, prosecution, and conviction. And Mike just talked about deterrence, rehabilitation, incapacitation as primary instruments for the creation of public safety. We would assert that public safety really needs to be thought of as in the following way. Public safety is a condition of life in which people are free to come and go, free of victimization and the fear of victimization. And the object of the system ought to be the creation of public safety, the mobilization of assets within our society to deliver it. To try to make this point more vividly, I'd really uh, try a couple of examples on you. Uh, really to address first the question of who the primary creators of public safety are. Uh, think of the safest neighborhood in Wisconsin. Um, if you're me, you ride your bike through Shorewood all the time, and uh, you think of that as a pretty darn safe place. Uh, if you think about, alternatively, the most unsafe neighborhood in Wisconsin, uh, what might come to mind are uh, the north side of Milwaukee, Two zip codes there produce about 50% of the prisoners in the state and the probationers and the parolees. And if you visit there, you'll see that it's markedly different from Shorewood uh, here in Madison. Now, you might ask, well, what makes Shorewood so safe? Um, is it that they're slam dunking every offender that comes down the pike? Um, arrest, prosecution, and conviction galore? Actually, there's way more arrest, prosecution, and conviction going on on the north side of Milwaukee than there is in Shorewood. And what it suggests, really, is that public safety uh, is not a product of the criminal justice system. It is not its principal creator. Rather, public safety, the rules that we agree to live by, are principally taught in families, churches, schools, little leagues, uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and in organizations of those kinds. Uh, and as we think about public safety, even in places in which it is in disrepair, uh, we would assert that one uh, major objective of those who work in the criminal justice system ought to be the mobilization of those assets that can bring naturally occurring forces to bear on behavior so as to bring greater compliance and greater socialization. Uh, that isn't to say that the agencies of the criminal justice system shouldn't be doing some of their conventional work. Again, I would very quickly use an illustration that I'm going to uh, come back to in just a few minutes. 
Some years ago, I was asked by the district attorney in Hennepin County, uh, up in Minnesota, she's now the senator from Minnesota, to come up there and work with them in a problem and what I came to call the corner of Chicago and Lake. Corner of Chicago and Lake was a part of Minneapolis, I think once and now returning to substantial vibrancy, uh, working class neighborhood, there's a really big hospital there, a lot of small businesses. Uh, Honeywell wasn't too far away. There was actually a very big Sears warehouse there that had begun to deteriorate. The neighborhood had quite, quite rapidly a lot of gang activity, assault of behavior. I gave a talk about this once and a woman came up to me afterwards and told me that her sister had been murdered at the corner of Chicago and Lake. So it's not like this is just a lot of low level activity going on. This is a place that had become a magnet. Uh, also in part because of the fact that it was a transfer point for the north, south, and east, west buses in Minneapolis. And so they had very large numbers of people, including young people, congregating in this area at times of day when it was vulnerable. Well, we worked with the folks up there. The prosecutor played a very vital role, but as did community groups, in trying to think through how to create this thing called the condition of public safety and to return the place to vibrancy. Uh, I think we did a reasonably good job uh, amongst the things that had to be done was the old warehouse that had become a magnet for drug activity had to be torn down. Uh, the bus transfer point had to be moved off the street. Uh, the corrections department uh, much more aggressively supervised the offenders who were uh, um, drawn to this place. Discovery was made through work with the police that about 50% of the people who were being arrested in this area were people who were on supervision. And therefore, the fact of correctional supervision actually afforded leverage over them to try and uh, diminish their presence in the kind of activity that they were engaged in there. The place was cleaned up, and the prosecutors played a vital role in doing so. And in saying that the conventional uh, uses of the criminal justice system were important would be an understatement because they were important. It's just that they were applied in far more surgical ways, I think, than we so often do. Far more strategically, not with the idea that we're going to arrest and prosecute everybody that we can, but we're really going to do it in a more targeted way that's more likely to be effective. Now, that's a sort of long way around, again, just to repeat my two points. One is public safety is a condition in which people are free to live their lives free of victimization. And what we really want is people who feel that they own public safety. The other is, is that the invocation of naturally occurring forces can be a powerful tool in bringing it about. And the criminal justice system, given the recitation that we made earlier about how it does with uh, conventional arrest, prosecution, and conviction, really ought to be thinking about the mobilization and use of those naturally occurring assets, because that is where so much power lies in creating the condition that we're talking about. So having offered this uh, qualified critique of the conventional operations of the criminal justice system, we do think that there are some promising new approaches and we like to describe what some of those are. Some of the promising new approaches are animated by some basic propositions. One of which, and Walter has touched on this, is that criminal justice practitioners, police, prosecutors, criminal court judges, corrections officials, can be more effective if they can find ways to harness the power of informal social control in the interests of public safety. For example, I remember a police officer I used to work with in Madison, and Pat Malloy and Chief Ray will remember Avito Chernelia. Avito was an officer, he worked on the west side of Madison, worked around Memorial High School, and he, like many of us, dealt with the common problem of teenagers drinking, underage drinking and all the vandalism and disorder that goes along with it. Avito had developed a, a, an arrangement and an understanding with the the high school coaches at Memorial High School, for those students who were student athletes, uh, that Vito would catch drinking underage on the weekend nights, uh, rather than process them through the formal juvenile court system, he would quietly on Monday morning go talk to the coaches and tell them who he caught, and the coaches would take care of the matter. The kid would sit out the next game, would run extra laps in practice and so forth, because ultimately what, what Officer Chernelia recognized was that to a 17-year-old athlete, 
What your coach holds over your head is infinitely more powerful than a $25 citation or even a whipping from your, your mother. Um, and the officer cleverly figured out a way in which he could leverage his own authority to invoke that informal authority. Today, many Madison police officers are now have developed, worked with, and supported uh, team peer courts and such, such that officers can refer some low-level offending cases to courts in which uh, young offenders are adjudicated by their peers. <clears throat> but we actually know that even for serious criminal offending, where the invocation of the criminal process is clearly warranted, we can still be more effective through intelligent leveraging of state authority. For example, in uh, several communities in North Carolina, police and prosecutors have worked to persuade mothers and grandmothers of drug dealers to exercise their authority over their sons and grandsons to quit dealing drugs. And they did so by building airtight criminal cases against these drug dealers, but remarkably agreeing to withhold prosecution and going further, offering assistance to the drug dealers if the drug dealers agreed to immediately quit dealing drugs. And remarkably, this approach has led to the decline and evaporation of entire drug markets in ways that the police and prosecutors had previously thought unimaginable. In our own state, here in Sheboygan, a couple of years ago, Sheboygan police officer worked to organize homeowners in some of the residential neighborhoods of Sheboygan that were beginning to see crack cocaine houses popping up throughout the city of Sheboygan, once the safest city in the United States. And what the police officer did is to organize the community uh, to put pressure on the owners of the properties that were being rented to drug dealers to evict the drug dealers from those properties. And using very strict standards, the police officer was able to document over 85 drug houses in Sheboygan that were closed down through this process. Interestingly, it, the threat was backed up by the prospects of civil property abatement. So that if the landlord refused to evict, the city could take action, but interestingly, the city never found occasion to have to carry out that particular threat. The keys to this are to clearly communicate credible threats of punishment if the offending does not desist and then to carry out those pun that punishment swiftly and certainly. But interestingly, the punishment need not be incarceration, need not be a fine. The key is to find that form of punishment that from the offender's perspective is important to him or her. Uh, Madison police officers today have developed what is known as the State Street Ban. That means it's possible for some offenders to get banned from State Street. You can't be there anymore as a condition of bail. Because what the police officers who developed this, this idea began to recognize is that for some offenders, the threat of being banned from State Street, where one's friends are, where the panhandling can occur, where the booze can be bought, where the offending can occur, where fun can be had, is, is a much greater threat than the prospects of spending a night in jail. And the police, in that instance, have learned to leverage their authority to actually get the offenders to care about something more uh, than, than simple punishment. And when this works, we actually may not even have to impose the punishment, or certainly not to the degree to the degree that we might otherwise have to. Now this requires for this uh, to, to work that we target, concentrate the limited criminal justice resources on those few offenders in order to leverage the behavior of many other offenders. And some measure of deterrence can be realized through official warning or through informal social sanctions without fully committing to arrest or prosecution but all too often we move perhaps too quickly to full arrest and prosecution before availing ourselves of all the deterrence we might get out of lesser threats. In each of these examples that we've offered, formal authority is used as leverage 
to mobilize informal authority. There's another example on State Street, and, and having worked State Street for many years, I recognize the age-old problem of panhandling on State Street. Madison police have actually come up with a sensible, a much more effective solution than I ever thought of, and that was to develop through city ordinances regulations as to where one is permitted to panhandle on State Street. And it turns out that there are only two locations on State Street where it is legally permissible to do so. The police, having enacted that ordinance, now then go about educating the panhandlers as to where those locations are. <coughs> and what's fascinating is that today the panhandlers themselves have organized such to almost become self-regulated. They take turns at the few spots where it's permissible to panhandle, and moreover, they occasionally will report an offender, somebody who's taking too long at the spot, to the police officer. Now, it, it shows how the, pol the police officers recognized, as I did, that it was impossible to, to arrest and to cite one's way out of this problem. And so uh, uh, this creative solution was applied. A second animating principle here is that we think that the aim of the criminal justice system should be as much to prevent crime and disorder as it is simply to redress its past commission. But in fact, many police agencies devote relatively few resources assertively to crime prevention, and many district attorney's offices devote even less. The crime prevention function is viewed as ancillary rather than central to the mission of many criminal justice agencies. For crime prevention to be truly effective, it needs to be taught, it needs to be emphasized, it needs to be adequately resourced. We also increasingly know from good uh, criminological work that crime is caused as much by opportunity as it is caused by moral failure. A great deal of criminology focuses on the, on the moral fail, failings of offenders, and yet there is a tremendous amount of influence by just the opportunity, the ease with which one can commit crime that drives it. And in fact, it's far easier if you think about it, to reduce opportunity than it is to fix or repair everyone's moral failings. There is an important theory, new theory, relatively new theory in criminology called routine activity theory, which fairly simply posits that crime occurs when a motivated offender encounters a suitable target or victim in some environment that lacks capable guardianship. So one way of depicting that is in the form of this triangle in which you have motivated offenders on one side, suitable targets and victims on another, and places on the third side. The theory suggests that the, if, if it is necessary to have all three elements for crime to occur, then removal of any one of those elements would suffice to control the crime. What we know is that to a great extent, police and prosecutors devote the vast majority of their attention and resources to trying to control offenders. When if the theory is correct, they might get equal gains or maximize those gains by focusing on better protecting targets and victims or increasingly we're recognizing better management of places such that crime is harder to commit there or less likely to occur there. One clever way of thinking about this triangulated <laughs> notion, some colleagues of mine came up with this as a helpful way of thinking about it. We know that actually there's a high concentration. Crime is not evenly concentrated among people or among the places where it occurs. As Walter suggested, uh, we know that very few places in any community account for the vast a very high percentage of, of all crimes that occur there. We might think of these as dens of iniquity, a handful of locations where crime just seems to occur prolifically. The same is true with offenders. A relatively small number of offenders, perhaps 10%, uh, the 10% most prolific offenders would account for up to half of all the crimes that occur. And the same also is true with victims, who we might think of as sitting ducks. We know, in fact, that many victims are victimized over and over again, and it has much to do with the nature of their, their uh, lifestyle and the, the people with whom they associate. 
And so a key to this is to learn where are those dens of iniquity, who are the sitting ducks, who are the ravenous wolves, and concentrate our attention on them. We'll get to that one, huh? <laughs> Uh, situational crime prevention is, is a concept that has emanated out of routine activity theory, and it essentially says that it, it aims to reduce the opportunities for crime to occur by altering the way in which the immediate environment is managed so that the potential offender perceives that it's not worth trying to commit a crime either because it's going to require too much effort, the risk of being detected is too high, the rewards for committing this crime are too low, the offender is not sufficiently provoked to commit the crime, or the offender's excuses or rationalizations for committing the crime are taken away. Now, suicide. Suicide itself is not a crime, and so this story actually is not about crime, but it has parallels, and I think, it, it, uh, to the criminal context. In the United Kingdom, in the 1950s, fully 50% of all suicides committed in England and Wales were committed by so-called sticking one's head in the oven, asphyxiating oneself with lethal gas. But how was gas produced in 1950s England? It was produced through the burning of coal. In the 1960s, having nothing to do with suicide prevention, there was a shift in energy away from coal as the primary heating fuel to petroleum oil. That shift in type of fuel led to only 20% of suicides in the United Kingdom being committed by sticking one's head in the oven, from 50% to 20%. And then in the 1970s, there was another shift in energy supply from petroleum oil to natural gas. Natural gas actually has zero carbon monoxide in it or very low levels, and the percentage of suicides committed by sticking one's head in the oven had dropped to all of 1%. Now what one might expect would happen is that as it became less possible to kill oneself by sticking one's head in the oven, that people would then go find another way to do it. You could jump off a bridge, you could shoot yourself. Well, could you shoot yourself? Remember, this is England, not America. And so access to guns was not, remains much lower than it is here. And it turns out that there are many reasons why people do not substitute one form of suicide for another. And so we, the, the interesting part of the story is that there was not a wholesale displacement to other forms of suicide when the opportunity to commit suicide was changed. We do have actually hundreds of examples now all carefully evaluated of how the situational crime prevention of, approach can prevent crime. The key to this is to understand crime problems in very specific ways. There are hundreds of different crime and disorder problems in the same fashion that there are literally thousands of different diseases and ailments in the medical field. Effective management of crime must be tailored to the specific type of crime, not to generic categories. And it argues in favor of criminal justice agencies employing professionally trained analysts to help them understand the nature of these specific crime problems. We also know that it's important to understand the communities of interest, to understand what stakes are at interest with respect to each of these crime problems, with specificity such that we can understand the causes of the crime, the contributing factors, and then learn to broker responsibility, to think about who bears responsibility for changing and altering the conditions that drive these crime problems. We know that parties other than the police, prosecutors, and criminal courts often have far greater capacity to reshape and to control the conditions that drive crime. Some years ago, I was riding with the police in Tempe, Arizona. It was 112 degrees, and the police officer was getting call after call for what were known as beer runs. The beer run was 
beer would be stacked outside the convenience store. A uh, nice cold beer, how they kept it cold in 112 degrees, I'm not sure, but it was nice cold beer stacked right in the sidewalk in front of the Quickie Mart. And this was what the police were spending their time doing, chasing after beer thieves. One at some point had to wonder, although we would hold the thief responsible for stealing the beer, wouldn't at some point it occur to the merchant <laughs> to bring the beer inside? And the interesting question is, imagine a merchant who, having been advised by the police that this beer is so easy to steal, and the police are getting tired of chasing after beer thieves, and the, and the DA can't prosecute them anyway, would you please move your beer inside? Imagine the convenience store owner who says to the police, no. What responsibility do, does that merchant bear for generating such an easy opportunity for crime to occur? We have seen in the realm of auto theft. The incidence of auto theft across the United States has dropped considerably in the past decade. And it doesn't have a great deal to do with better policing or more prosecution of auto thieves. It has very much to do with the better design of the steering columns on automobiles that make them harder to steal. This type of vehicle, a General Motors vehicle from uh, was uh, we had thieves who could break into this and steal this vehicle uh, in under 30 seconds because of the design. You could crack open that steering column. And so police were dealing with thousands upon thousands of auto thefts. And the police appealed to the automobile manufacturers to change the design, but got nowhere for several decades. Uh, this is a... a New home under construction in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this is a project that Herman Goldstein worked on. The problem was, as these new homes were being built, the appliances, the washers, dryers, refrigerators, were being stolen before the home could be secured. Through a great deal of analysis by the Charlotte police with Herman's assistance, they ultimately figured out that there was, in fact, a fairly simple way to prevent these thefts, and it, and it had to do with recognizing that the appliances had to be hardwired into the cabinetry, had to be certified by an electrical inspector. Before the home could be fully secured, it turned out that one builder had figured out the clever way to do it was to put in the appliance, wire it up, get the certification inspection, and then, with the turn of a couple of screws, take the door off. Take the door off the dishwasher, the door off the refrigerator, the door off the oven, and if you think about it, who would steal a refrigerator without a door? <laughs> it rendered the target worthless, but it could be rendered valuable instantly. And that, more than any of the stakeouts or prosecutions that the police engaged in, led to a significant reduction in these. Here in Madison, we recently had uh, Madison police had a lot of problems with the Club Majestic uh, on King Street with shootings and tremendous degree of violence. If you think about it, when's the last time you've heard of problems at Club Majestic? They just disappeared. But how did that happen? It happened mainly through a change in management of the, of the establishment, a change, and so we recognize that it's the management of establishments that has far more to do with the level of violence in them than anything the police are able to do. Here on our own campus, so one of my students worked with the campus police studying the problem of textbook theft. And for especially for any law students here, you recognize these things cost money, a lot of money. Well, through this analysis, what the officer was able to, and our student was able to figure out, was that there really are only two places in Madison one could steal or sell stolen textbooks. The university bookstore and another bookstore on State Street. So the officer's thinking was not just how do I catch textbook thieves, but how do I interrupt the economic market for stolen textbooks. And what he figured out was that very few stolen textbooks got sold here at University Bookstore. Mainly they were sold here. The officer then just set about figuring out what is it that they do that they don't do. Having figured it out, the officer then approached the Madison Common Council and had an ordinance changed to require all bookstores who buy textbooks to adopt the good practices of the University Bookstore. Having done that, the officer, by latest count, reports that the incidence of textbook theft has declined on the order of 
significant. Madison police are currently working on trying to improve uh, the problem, control of the problem of uh, nuisance offending by chronic street offenders and thinking about trying to shift some of that responsibility to the liquor stores that habitually sell alcohol to the problem individuals. All of these approaches implicate a much wider array of people than just the police, the prosecutors, and the criminal courts to take measures to prevent crime. But it always raises questions about who bears what responsibility. And we would argue that the responsibility ought to be assessed in the specific context of each problem. What is it reasonable to ask victims to do to protect themselves? What is it reasonable to do to ask the managers and owners of businesses to do to prevent crime? In economic terms, it, this might be thought of as controlling, correcting for the externalized costs of generating crime. One good example in many jurisdictions, stealing gas, driving away without paying for it is a huge problem. I recently learned police in Tampa, Florida passed an, a county ordinance to require all gas stations to require prepayment for gasoline. And the reduction in thefts has been on the order of 7,000 thefts eliminated per year in that county. If you think about it, why, why do uh, gas station owners not like the prepay policy? It has to do with the economics of the retail gasoline sales. What they want are merchant or customers to come into the store to do impulse buying, to buy some beef jerky, buy a six pack, buy some other things in addition to the gas because that's where the profit margin is. But effectively what they're doing is shifting the costs off to the taxpayers in the form of police and prosecution resources. So we'd ask the question again, who bears that responsibility for controlling these conditions? Mike has been emphasizing that effective crime control and promising new measures in criminal justice administration focus not only on offenders, but on places that are vulnerable and need management and on victims who also need protection from crime. That's not to say, however, that we should ignore offenders entirely and not pay them any heed at all. Instead, what we need are effective, targeted strategies so that the resources that we devote to supervising offenders are used in a way that increases public safety and doesn't simply drain resources. One good example comes in the context of correctional supervision. Although we say that our job in promoting public safety is to decrease crime, which would mean increasing the success of persons under supervision insofar as they're not committing new crimes, Instead, what we often do is set them and our communities up for failure. As Mike mentioned briefly, two-thirds of persons released from prison return within three years of their release. And in Wisconsin, in fact, more than half of our current state prison population is comprised of persons who have been incarcerated because of their failure to comply with the conditions of their supervised release. Some of these returning prisoners are incarcerated as a result of a new criminal violation and sometimes those violations do require severe sanctions, including incarceration. However, far too many people return to prison as a result of their failure to comply with the technical conditions of their supervised release. And in fact, in many jurisdictions, up to two-thirds of parole revocations occur not as a result of a new crime, but rather as a result of a technical rule violation. <coughs> many of these failures could be avoided entirely if those entrusted with community supervision were to tailor the conditions of supervision to the specific risks posed by the individuals under their supervision and to the conditions in which those individuals will find themselves. In other words, in the, uh, to the conditions and places that they'll find themselves and the victims whom they might hurt. Let's take as an example a person who's convicted of forgery and released from prison after a, a short period of incarceration. While under supervision, that person might be placed under standardized rules of supervision, which ordinarily could include a curfew or a prohibition on his consuming alcohol outside his home. Now let's imagine that this same individual decides to go out and have a late night drink with his buddies at the local tavern. Although this behavior in the context of his past criminal activity poses no substantial risk to the community in which he finds himself, it still subjects him to a very real risk of reincarceration. 
Although that result would consume substantial public resources and it would do nothing to advance public safety, it would still be a real risk that he faces and one that sadly occurs too often in our society. If correctional agents were to limit the conditions of supervision to those most closely related to the risk posed by the offender, they would instead advance public safety. And they can do this in two ways. I suggested just now that one would be to eliminate unnecessary conditions of supervision, to avoid paying attention to the behavior of offenders that doesn't actually trouble us as a community and pose a threat to public safety. The other, of course, is to focus on the offender's actual risks and use the power and legal authority afforded to correctional supervision agents to target those actual risks and perhaps impose a ban on State Street or other places that might cause an actual risk to public safety. If correctional agents focus their power to supervise on the actual risks posed by offenders, they can increase the success of community supervision without decreasing public safety. What we've suggested here has got uh, pretty substantial implications for the role of all the actors in the criminal justice system. Uh, what we've really sort of suggested is they have to let go of certain things and actually take on some other things. Uh, on the take on uh, column, or in the take on column, uh, I'd put very high on the list ownership of public safety. Because I think an awful lot of criminal justice agencies define their roles in more specific terms. The police own arrest and street prosecutors own prosecution, courts own sentencing. Uh, corrections folks own the supervision of offenders. But none of those is owning the creation of the condition in which people are free to come and go, free of victimization, and the fear of victimization. Now, my nominee <coughs> for owning public safety, and I'm not sure that Mike and Cecilia necessarily agree, would be the prosecutors. Uh, I say that because I have a conception of them as the ministers of justice and obviously being a minister of justice would have one own public safety, that being an important element of justice. I also think prosecutors are positioned uh, and have both the legal authority and the moral authority to in a sense call the meeting and to mobilize the assets one must mobilize if one is going to get the resources and bring them to bear uh, on this problem. Now I've had the opportunity to work in prosecutors in a lot of with prosecutors in a lot of places. I mentioned before Hennepin County, uh, others are Indianapolis, Brooklyn, Austin, uh, all places in which the prosecutors, the district attorneys, were not waiting in the justice building for the cases to come in, but were actually assigning, as they're now doing in Milwaukee, prosecutors to neighborhoods, to police stations, to fire stations, to community groups, and places where they could make far better diagnosis of the problems to public safety that existed in those places and situated themselves in partnerships so that they were far better able to mobilize the assets, including the criminal justice assets, and bring them to bear, as I say, far more surgically when that was required, but also do a few of the things that I mentioned happened on the corner of Chicago and Lake to make it a far safer place things that I don't think we would conventionally think criminal justice agents would do, but which were obviously a precondition to creating a condition of safety in that place. Now in the world of policing, where I've spent most of my career, and largely at uh, Herman Goldstein's urging over the past 30 years, the police have, in fact, uh, taken the lead, I think, among all criminal justice actors in fundamentally rethinking what their role is with respect to public safety to move beyond the notion that police are merely enforcers of the criminal law, more than merely patrollers of the public space, but to something beyond that, identifiers of public safety problems, diagnosticians of those problems, and even brokers of the responsibility among various actors in society for addressing those particular problems and preventing the crime and disorder. I just recently returned from conferences, one in the United Kingdom, uh, one in California, at which police officers were coming from all over those countries, together actually talking about the ideas that Herman first developed here at the UW Law School, the problem-oriented approach to policing. 
talking exclusively about the specific types of problems that, that they have been addressing within their jurisdictions and competing sometimes for, uh, for awards, the privilege of getting one's photo taken with Herman and a, and a good prize. <laughs> this past year, the conference in the United Kingdom, the best projects submitted and discussed dealt with such problems as theft of metal, sexual abuse of teenage runaways, and domestic violence. Here in the United States, uh, just last week, our best projects dealt with problems related to crime in budget motels, auto theft in Canada, thefts of purses from shopping carts in England, and gang violence in several jurisdictions. Unlike police and prosecutors, judges aren't able to roam the streets seeking out public safety problems to solve. But that doesn't mean that judges don't play a critically important role in the problem-oriented world that we imagine. Judges have a unique vantage point from which to view community problems, seeing in their courtrooms on a daily basis and on a large scale the problems of their community. And in this context, I would suggest that the community with which the judge should concern herself is that of her relevant jurisdiction. Perhaps more than any other player in the criminal justice system, in the eyes of the community, judges possess a certain legitimacy and moral authority as a result of their judicial position. And by mobilizing that legitimacy and exercising it strategically, judges can convince others within the criminal justice system and the larger community to respond to problems in non-traditional ways. Often, I've heard judges express some concern and hesitation about taking on an active role in problem solving because they fear that it might compromise their duty to remain neutral arbiters of justice and would somehow be improper or inappropriate. In fact, however, federal and state codes of judicial conduct encourage participation by judges in efforts to improve the law, the legal system, and the administration of justice. Wisconsin's judicial code explicitly recognizes that judges stand in a unique position to contribute to the improvement of the legal system and encourages judges to engage in such efforts when possible. The Federal Code of Judicial Ethics and relevant advisory opinions do the same. So, how might judges best exercise their authority and use it to increase public safety and encourage the prudent use of the limited resources of the criminal justice system? Well, to make a very modest start, trial level judges can begin within their courtrooms by impose, making sure that they do no harm and that each sentence that a judge imposes is a plausible response to the crime that has been committed, to the offender who has committed the offense, and to the larger context in which that crime took place. If judges understand the larger social context within which a crime has occurred, they are able to more accurately assess the deterrent value of any sentence that's imposed or the rehabilitative value of such a sentence. But of course, in order to impose such a <coughs> sentence, a judge will need contextual, problem-oriented information about the context in which the crime occurred, of course, and also about the full range of sentencing options available to the judge, both in the community and in the jail or prison system. When counsel fail to provide such information, and I'm sure it will shock all of, those, all of you who are lawyers to learn that counsel don't automatically produce such information and data, uh, judges should not hesitate to require it of them. In addition, beyond the adjudication and sentencing of any individual defendant, a judge might push for a broader examination of how an underlying crime problem is being addressed by criminal prosecution or otherwise. For example, if a judge notices a sudden increase in the number of defendants coming before him for sentencing on charges of methamphetamine abuse or production, he might fairly ask the prosecuting agency and community leaders what steps are being taken to reduce the meth problem in their area? Since under such circumstances, it would appear that the traditional cycle of arrest, prosecution, and sentencing is simply not doing its job. Depending on the dynamics of a jurisdiction, a judge's efforts to raise questions about broad issues might take many forms, including convening meetings with or between local decision makers or stakeholders. Additionally, as appropriate, 
Judges might also use more traditional fora to raise concerns about particular recurring problems in opinions or other writings. For example, in recent years, opinions and other statements by federal judges throughout the country questioning the fairness and effectiveness of federal sentencing guidelines for certain drug offenses and computer-related crimes have played a role in prompting the United States Sentencing Commission to undertake a closer study of the propriety of those guidelines. Finally, we would be remiss to ignore the growing popularity in both the state and federal systems of specialized courts, including drug courts, homelessness courts, reentry courts, and others, in which judges, prosecutors, and defense counsel set aside to some degree their traditional adversarial roles in an attempt to address in a judicial forum the personal problems that have led particular offenders to commit crimes. Although these crimes raise a number of ethical and practical questions that are well beyond the time that we have left here today, their rapid growth is evidence of a desire on the part of actors throughout the criminal justice system for a new way of doing <coughs> business that does more than process people through the traditional system and seeks instead to place criminal activity in a larger social context. In addition to the roles of police, prosecutors, and judges, there's another all too often overlooked player in the criminal justice system who deserves mention. That is the community corrections officer. By virtue of their expansive legal authority and close connection to vulnerable communities and persons at risk of offending, community corrections agencies play a pivotal role in enhancing public safety. These officers and the agencies for which they work have the potential to play a significant role in shaping new responses to crime at multiple points throughout the criminal justice system. For example, even before an offender is sentenced, probation officers are often commissioned to draft pre-sentence investigation reports containing facts relevant to offenders and crimes that judges will rely upon in sentencing. Corrections agents, similar to counsel as I discussed earlier, can position judges to sentence for public safety by developing and presenting to the court information relevant not only to the offender and to in his history, but also to the larger context of the crime problem that's occurring, and to the resources in the community and in the correctional system that might plausibly address the risks posed by that offender. And as I mentioned earlier, once an offender has been placed on supervision, correctional agents can further advance public safety by supervising offenders consistent with the risks they actually pose and the situations in which they find themselves, tailoring conditions of supervision, and utilizing sanctions short of full revocation to address violations that are not in themselves criminal. Similarly, correctional agents can increase their effectiveness by sharing information and using their robust authority to work in partnership with police, community members, and other criminal justice actors. I wish I could regale you with tales of successful stories of correctional supervision increasing public safety, but I'm afraid that corrections has not yet caught up with the work of the police. Uh, we have a long way to go. I was at a conference last week in which I was talking with a, a head of a major um, American probation and parole association and asked why corrections wasn't utilizing these problem-oriented um, mechanisms more in their supervision of offenders. The response I received showed me that our imagination needs to be greater in the context of correctional supervision because the response I received was, well, police are supposed to enhance public safety. The community, after all, is one of their clients. We're just supposed to supervise offenders. And I thought, we need more creative vision because I believe our communities can expect and deserve more than that from corrections. Finally, I think that corrections can do the best good by increasing and increase the effectiveness of their supervision by engaging the normative forces that exist in offenders' lives. Few of us here today avoid criminal activity purely out of fear of punishment. Most of us avoid crime, both because we believe that criminal activity is bad and because we fear the disapprobation of those people in our work, home, and community who would disapprove of our deviant behavior. Similarly, if past offenders are to successfully avoid future acts of criminality, they require the pro-social influence of other people committed to the norms and values that are reflected in our criminal law. These people may be employers, reliable family members, or even community volunteers. 
but by seeking out such persons and empowering them to serve as mentors and informal guardians, correctional agents can create a natural form of supervision that will outlast the formal engagement of the criminal justice system and thereby advance public safety in a long and lasting way. So we think that all of this, this problem-oriented approach, the situational approach, uh, has some implications for research as well. We think that there's a great deal for uh, a much greater body of nuanced research into the interventions that are tailored to the context of specific crime and disorder problems to discover what seems to work best under what conditions. It had occurred to, to Herman and myself uh, going at least back 10 years that at least in the police world, there didn't exist this organized, readily accessible body of knowledge that could inform police practitioners as to what is the best way to deal with the crime problems that they routinely confront. And so with some modest funding from the US Department of Justice, we set out on a project to try to build up that body of knowledge. And these guidebooks that are sitting on the table uh, in the middle of the room reflect an installment after 10 years on building this body of knowledge. With funding support from the federal government, we research what do we know about very specific crime and disorder problems. We estimate there are somewhere around three to 350 different kinds of crime problems that the police routinely deal with. We think we maybe have got a, maybe one sixth of the project done, a lot of work yet to be done. But on topics ranging from assaults in and around bars, to child uh, pornography on the internet, uh, to street prostitution, uh, to gun violence among young offenders, and on and on. We've even uh, developed one guide applying, thinking about the approach to counterterrorism and understanding it as a crime problem. Now, this body of work is accessible not only here, but we've also created on a publicly accessible website, again, funded with, from the US Department of Justice to make this information available to practitioners all over the world. I think we've gone on longer than we probably should, and so I'm just gonna say a quick word about the implications of all this for legal education. Uh, and I'm gonna do it by telling a quick story about Frank Remington. Uh, it should be fairly apparent that if uh, we're gonna train lawyers to work in the system that we imagine, they're going to have to have experience. They're going to have to know context. They're going to have to be able to be more than technicians. They're going to have to solve problems. Uh, and in order to do that, at least in the criminal justice system, we're going to have to put them into places where they can gain the experience and get access to actors in the system in order to do so. I'd say by way of comment on what Mike just said, that if you're going to do the kind of problem-oriented research that we're suggesting needs to be done, the researchers, including law professors, are going to need access to police agencies, to correctional agencies, uh, to prosecutors' offices. And that isn't something that necessarily comes easy. One has to work at that, develop a web of relationships, a relationship of trust, so that the information that those folks have or need is something that you can help them find. Now that's not easy to do. That's a kind of action research that we would argue we need more of. Uh, and if we're gonna uh, reflect that kind of action research in, in legal education, I think we're gonna have to put students into similar kinds of situations. That's why we've tried to develop as many experiential opportunities as we have here at the law school. But here's the story about Frank. Frank and I used to talk about the prospects for experiential education all the time. And we used to talk about it with respect to criminal justice, and we used to talk about it with respect to other areas. And those of you who know Frank knew what an incredible optimist he was. But I have to confess to you that he was not very optimistic about this. He was not very optimistic about the prospect for what we call law and action programs. And he expressed his lack of op optimism to me in the following way. He'd say, Walter, think of it this way. If you're a law professor teaching a course in a classroom, uh, the law school delivers the students who simply register. The law school tells you where to go. You call the book mart and you tell them what book you want. You show up and there's a blackboard, students, and now a PowerPoint, and you teach your class. 
He said, if you want to engage in experiential education, if you want to put kids in the back of police cars the way Mike and Herman have in prisons, the way we have in prosecutor's offices, uh, just think of the challenges that you have to confront. Uh, first of all, there is the little matter of developing the relationships with those agencies so that they'll take your kids. Uh, secondly, you've got to get your kids to the place that they're going to have this experience. Uh, that requires the raising of money in order to finance the whole operation, including the movement of the kids to the places. And finally, there's the question of the textbook. Well, there isn't any textbook for what we're talking about. I don't think West has published the casebook um, on problem-oriented approaches to the criminal justice system, though maybe it should. Uh, but obviously, the kind of learning that we're talking about has a very opportunistic quality, though it really has got an awful lot of theoretical basis. But the fact of the matter is, because there is no textbook, one is going to have to develop one's own curriculum, and as I said, be opportunistic about it. Now, I would argue that we need a lot of change in legal education, and I would argue that we need it along the lines that I've discussed. And I believe that because I think context thinking strategically about these kinds of problems, developing the kinds of skills that position one to make the kinds of contributions we think need to be made, really require a richer kind of education than I think we are presently uh, configured to provide. One of the ways in which we've tried to do it here is to develop a new internship named after one of our 1972 graduates, Gary Hayes, of the Gary Hayes Police Prosecution Internship in which we've assigned our students and placed them jointly with a police agency and its corresponding district attorney's office somewhere in Wisconsin, not to just hone their legal technical skills, but to think through a particular crime problem of mutual interest to those agencies and in seeking out a more sensible community solution to the problem. We've had uh, Joel Plant, who's a graduate of our law school, now works for the mayor's office, who's here in the room, was our pioneer in this. He worked with the Appleton Police and Outagamie County DA on Asian youth gang problems. We've had students work in Milwaukee on domestic violence problems. Uh, students here work here at UW-Madison and with the Dane County DA's office on acquaintance rape, on stalking, on home invasion, robbery. We've had students work on problems in crime and abandoned and foreclosed homes in Milwaukee and so forth. What we're trying to do is to develop law students who are more than just competent legal technicians, but actually are competent public safety strategists. Let me just say that I gave a very primitive version of this talk about 10 years ago, and as soon as I finished, a hand shot up, and the person asked the question that is probably occurring to all of you, and that is, what's the best argument against what you are talking about? After all, if our ideas are so terrific, why haven't they been implemented? <laughs> <laughs> well. First is the orientation of the criminal justice system itself. Criminal justice and criminal law is rooted in ideas of individual culpability and accountability. The criminal justice system, as I teach my 1Ls every, or at the beginning of each semester, stigmatizes conduct of which we disapprove and punishes those who violate our laws. Such punishment is ordinarily calculated based upon the perceived culpability of the offender and the severity of the harm he or she has caused. This intense focus on the offender, him or herself, is deeply embedded in the criminal justice system. And, to be honest, it runs counter to our suggestion that public safety requires less of a focus on offenders and a greater focus on the environments in which they act. A more practical ob obstacle to implementation is the nature of bureaucracy itself, which resists wholesale change. After all, that's what makes it stable. Flexible, complex problem solving of the kind we are promoting is more difficult, especially at first, than simplistic, often ineffective, but very well understood and frequently utilized approaches to crime and disorder that are most commonly employed. Perhaps the most serious obstacle to implementing our vision is a capacity problem. The approaches we suggest require both imagination and the development of information of particular kinds that have not traditionally been developed by police, prosecutors, or correctional agents. Such information may be difficult to find, information about places and patterns of crime, for example. 
And although individuals in some places have begun gathering such information, until more agencies develop the capacity to do so, the ability of the system to function broadly within a problem-oriented model will necessarily be limited. There are also, of course, problems of leadership and cooperation. Before change can occur, someone must take on the additional burden of organizing stakeholders and potential brokers of public safety. That person or agency must also take on the political risk of appearing insufficiently committed to punishing offenders and dealing harshly with those who eschew our social values and laws. Although some prominent political figures, such as District Attorney Joe Hines of Brooklyn, have successfully met that challenge, others with less political capital, or less perceived political capital, are often hesitant to follow their lead. Moreover, in order for problem-oriented approaches to crime to be successful across the criminal justice system, traditional actors must be willing to cede some measure of autonomy to other system actors and to members of the community broadly defined. That shifting of power requires actors to move to a more participatory and less authoritarian model for the delivery of public safety. And finally, if the methods we've been discussing are to take firm hold, the criminal justice system would have to provide internal incentives in the form of recognition and opportunities for advancement to those public officials who are willing to take the risk of trying new and less quantifiable means of trying to achieve and advance public safety. And yet we remain optimistic. Why not? <clears throat> it's sort of odd to think that maybe in this current economic downturn that there is cause for optimism, but in fact the pressure on state and local government budgets actually will compel and is compelling some re-examination of criminal justice, which is after all one of the most expensive functions of government. And although we title our talk Reimagining Criminal Justice, we uh, and those with whom we work closely we don't really have to reimagine it because we have firsthand evidence of the potential for effectiveness in this problem-oriented community justice and situational crime prevention work. What we are imagining and what we invite others to imagine is a system in which this type of work becomes routine and expected rather than occasional and surprising. When I was approached about uh, delivering this lecture, uh, I said that I would do so only if we could feature our young people, or at least some of them. Uh, I say some of them because I want to note, at least in the criminal justice program here, we've got others in the Remington Center in particular who are uh, other reasons for optimism. And I think the best reason for optimism is people like Mike and Cecilia because uh, they are going to carry the way forward and they are pretty clearly the kind of people that we want doing it. I'm just happy to still be recognized. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we took more time than we should have, but Mike uh, Ken suggested we should entertain some questions, uh, and we're happy to do so. Oh, the, as I said, the hour's late, <laughs> and yes, we won't sir. hold it against you if uh, you don't have any. In the green. Yes, sir. I was wondering uh, what you're trying to do on um, what improvements that I think can be made, not only to allow the people that are... Oh, okay. Uh, my question concerns uh, whether you would perceive it as an, as an improvement in the criminal justice system to permit uh, those people that are so-called on paper to uh, have the vote restored to them, I mean, once they're out of the physical confines of the prison that they're in. I was actually having this conversation just before the talk. My, my own sense is yes. I mean, the more, the more incentives you give anybody to behave well, to restore themselves to, uh, to good behavior, the greater the prospects of that. But I'll leave that to Walter. You may have a stronger view on that. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I just to quickly tell you, when Dave Cooper was the police chief, uh, he came to talk to me about somebody who he hoped would get a pardon. And I said to Dave, Dave, I'm sorry to tell you, but pardons just aren't in the cards uh, these days. The political uh, risk that is attached to pardoning anybody is so high that no governor will do so. Um, and so Dave and I started to consider the question, well, just what exactly is a pardon? And we said, well, actually what it is is the community expressing uh, I think a level of forgiveness and closure to a behavior that has occurred in the past. 
And we said, given the lack of political courage around questions like this, maybe we ought to get together a group of, of citizens who are recognized as responsible and respectable, and we ought to start issuing pardons. Um, we ought to pardon the people who deserve them, and we ought to make the decisions on the merits, uh, because given the political situation, it wasn't in the cards, and there at least ought to be some community expression, as I said, of closure and forgiveness, and I still believe that's true. Expanding the vote to persons who have, are on supervision, um, in some states to persons who have even completed their supervision but are still ineligible to vote, um, is important too because what it does is it broadens um, the, the client, the audience to whom political leaders feel accountable. If I'm accountable to my voters and persons who have criminal convictions are not among the voters, then I don't need to be attentive to their needs. At least that's a common misunderstanding. Um, among leaders, and I think the more people who are participating in the democratic process, the more responsive we'll be to all members of our community. Any other questions? Yes. You talked about people feeling safe. As a criminal defense attorney, I've often had the opportunity or un unfortunate situation where I've advised clients or friends to ne not call the police unless they feel they are in danger. They are at risk from the police as much as from the situation often. The police in domestic situations feel they have to arrest someone if they are called the situation. Um, people call 911 because they're afraid someone is going to commit suicide and the person ends up arrested and off their medication. It's a situation where the police can't be relied on to make the situation better. Yeah, and I, um, I think it points out we're, we're increasingly beginning to realize in policing not only why it's important for the police to be trusted and to be seen as fair uh, in its own right, but also because we increasingly recognize that when police are fundamentally distrusted by the community, the police are cutting themselves off from all of that informal social authority in the community that could be leveraged, could be invoked to help control crime and disorder. Mistrust of the police under undermines the legitimacy of the police institution and thereby makes the police less effective. Beginning to appreciate that uh, more profoundly, I think. And there's no doubt that there's a lot of work to be done to uh, increase the level of trust so that that legitimacy exists so that they're able to, to uh, uh, call on the forces that Mike is mentioning. I just tell you, Michael Smith tells a story about the 76th precinct in Brooklyn. They were about to uh, start a community policing effort. They were going to go around door to door and talk to people uh, and ask them what how they could help them, what their problems were. They started at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning. Calls start coming into the precinct station 5 after 9. There's a man here impersonating a police officer <laughs> asking how he could help me. <laughs> now, we'd be stupid to not acknowledge the existence of that attitude and that there is a basis for it, then obviously there's work to be done. Last question. take a look at partnering with other behavioral specialists that take a look at human behavior outside of corrections um, because these court treatment programs that I was um, part of in coordinating are very effective programs and the evidence base on the effectiveness of these programs and the lowered recidivism is very um, obvious and they're a very good program and actually it's quite interesting because they're not as complex to form as one would think. Our treatment team included our judge and our solicitor general, the probation officer, and then the treatment therapist. And it was very centralized and very complex and very multi-systemic and a very effective program. So I really appreciate the lecture and I'm very excited to hear that my home state is taking a look at some of these things. So thank you. Thank you.
Okay. No, not, not okay quite yet, dear Mike. Uh, <laughs> they know what's coming, but uh, anyway, if you just join me, this has been a terrific uh, presentation, novel and what we're looking uh, uh, in a great format. So thank you all very, very much. Um, come on, join me here. I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Cecilia becomes our very youngest ever uh, Gargoyle uh, recipient, but thank you very much, Cecilia. Mike, thank you, uh, and Walter, I've got one for you here. And please, everybody, join us upstairs for reception. Thank you all very much.